Radar Update. My name is Daniel Vallis, and welcome to our channel. The past two nights I've been going out trying to take pictures of Jupiter, but it's very low to the horizon, and I've just had a number of clouds in the way, and I really don't have a good view of the low horizon, so it's made it difficult, although Jupiter has been above the horizon for a number of minutes after the sunset. But I did get to at least enjoy creation and enjoy some beautiful sunsets. This is a beautiful time of the year and it's just a good time to be outdoors and just to be reminded of creation and to look up into the heavens, which is one thing I always encourage you to do. Just spend time out in creation and you will really get a better sense of how the celestial clock moves when you spend more time observing it and just seeing how it moves over time. And just a few days ago on September 30th, I took a picture of Jupiter. And as we talked about, it's getting ready to go off the scene. It's sinking lower and lower to the horizon. It's becoming less visible, harder to spot. And that's because the sun is getting closer to it. But we talked about the importance of how the scepter, this has been the main actor in the Revelation 12 sign that we've seen over the past few months and even past few years with the Star Bethlehem signs that we've seen too. For us to see Jupiter leaving the scene right here at this time, it's all choreographed. It's all very deliberate. It's all very organized. It's part of the sign. And that goes with the Shiloh prophecy. And it's talked about in Revelation chapter 12. So we're not surprised at all to see this precision of even this celestial event with the scepter departing off the scene, even in a sense disappearing into the clouds right at the horizon, disappearing into the clouds right at this time, shortly after the birth and the naming and the circumcision. It's all part of the same story. And it reminds us of so many things that we've studied and learned about as we've dived deeper into God's Word and learned about this beautiful tapestry of redemption. Now the scepter, Jupiter's only going to be on the scene for just a few more days, about the 26th and 27th of October, depending on your time zone. That's when Jupiter will be setting with the sun. It'll be setting at the same time as the sun, so you definitely won't be able to see it then, because it'll definitely be too close to the sun. And approximately just a rule of thumb is about two weeks before this point you won't be able to see jupiter anyway just because it'll be so close to the sun's glare and jupiter is also dimming at this time as well so combine those two approximately two weeks before this solar conjunction it's going to be completely off the scene you won't be able to see it those in the southern hemisphere will be able to see it just a little bit longer so that means the time that the scepter is going to be on the scene still is very, very limited. And it's really just a matter of days right now that we are expecting the scepter to depart off the scene. And that got me to thinking, if this is leaving now here at this point in the story, in the Revelation 12 story even, what was it doing previously? When was the last time Jupiter and the sun had a solar conjunction? Well, I backed up and looked. It happened last year in September 28th. That's when Jupiter set with the sun. That was the last solar conjunction. And this should catch our attention, the timing of this all, the synchronicity of it all, timed with this story, the Revelation 12 story, the sign of the Son of Man, everything that we've seen before, it's all been deliberate. It's all been choreographed. This needs to catch our attention. These are not just random events. And when you think about it, the solar conjunction, that's when Jupiter disappears off the scene for about four weeks, two weeks before and two weeks after. So here on 9-28-2016, about two weeks after this, Jupiter would be coming onto the scene. The scepter would be coming onto the scene about to tell a story of the Revelation 12 sign of the Son of Man. And here's just a video clip of where you can see in between these two solar conjunctions, the entire Revelation 12 sign took place between these two major celestial points. The entire pregnancy process, the birthing, the naming and circumcision time even as well. And then it ends with a departure, a perfect telling of the Revelation chapter 12, sign of the Son of Man. We can see these celestial markers, these solar conjunctions, perfectly bookending this story that has been told in the heavens that we've been observing for the past few months. And the more that we watch this sign and study it, the more we realize we're seeing something very deliberate, something very unique, something that is meant to catch our attention. This is a great and wondrous sign in all its intricacies. And we're at a time now where we've observed so much, we've learned so much, and we've even learned so much even recently here lately. And we've seen the story, we've seen this tapestry of redemption with the Shiloh sign and the sign of the Son of Man. We've been learning about a Redeemer. And so we now find ourselves where Jupiter is getting ready to leave the scene in roughly approximately two weeks back from October 26th. That's going to be around the 
11th and 12th of October, but that's a rough approximately, just somewhere around there. It's going to be disappearing for the final time just because of the sun's glare. Your location might affect that a little bit. If you have a good clear view of the horizon, you might be able to see it for just a little bit longer. But a good rule of thumb is two weeks out. And even right now, it's been very hard for me to try and find it, even though it's still above the horizon for about 40 minutes right now. We are witnessing a celestial telling, the telling of the end of the Revelation 12 story. When the scepter departs, when her child was caught up under God into his throne. We are seeing the celestial story, the sign portion of it, being brought to a close. And I wanted to let you know that we've updated the Revelation chapter 12 sign booklet. We've learned a lot in just the past few days, in the past few weeks, and so I wanted to update this booklet to put it in there because we've covered so much in the videos that sometimes it's hard just to remember what we've all covered, what we've learned, and particularly a lot of the technical details and the historical details. So definitely download this, print it out. It makes a good review right now. What have we seen? What has the Lord shown us? What has been the intricacies and in the design of the celestial sign that we've seen for over nine months now? It's meant to catch our attention. This is unique. This tells us something is very special about this time. And we also need to be paying attention to as this sign is concluding. Because this was shown to us for a reason. So we need to be watching all the more so, especially as it ends, because that's a conclusion. And we are expecting the gathering to Shiloh before the celestial reminder of the scepter departing. Now this booklet is 50 pages, and so there's a lot of the other information. But we've updated it with the new stuff that we've learned. And I've broken it down into the different stages and phases of the Revelation 12 sign. Because the Lord gave wisdom as we've been going forward of these different aspects. Just one portion at a time. Not so much the whole picture, but he gave us a little bit of wisdom here. And a little bit of wisdom about this section. And then another section. And then sometimes we've learned that we had to learn one thing before we could learn another thing. Because it all went together. So we put the information in there so you can review the technical information, the historical information, and the biblical information. And how these all tie together with what we have seen as we've looked up and as we've lifted up our heads and as we've studied scripture. We've talked about the dragon appearing, drawing a third of the stars of heaven. And we even dive into what the stars cast through the earth, a little bit about that. And there are two ways that this can be taken. One in a future reference of when the stars will fall, once the tribulation events happen. Also keeping in mind the time of perplexity when Satan is going to be messing with time to give himself more time. A lot of the celestial events that we have seen, they're going to be repeated, but with a different outcome along the way. So we keep in mind what Jesus told his disciples to keep in mind and understand about what Daniel prophesied the Antichrist would be doing around the midst. It's that time of perplexity when it will be put into his hand to mess with time. So these signs, the things that we've seen recently over the past few weeks and months, they're going to be repeated. But there's going to be a different outcome. But we have seen right now, just with Draco visually in the Revelation 12 sign, one way that the stars have been cast to the ground. We haven't covered it before. But if you research a number of articles, even before the Revelation 12 subject really became popular, one of the things that a number of people have talked about, just trying to understand the chapter in the past, have noted that, because of Draco's movement, the way it's spinning counterclockwise, it's automatically throwing and visually throwing the stars down to the ground. That's what it looks like it's doing when you watch it at night. Because of the way it's spinning, it looks like the tail is dragging and sweeping the stars and throwing them down to the ground. That's just a visual appearance. So there is that level of fulfillment with the Draco sign that we've seen recently in the Revelation 12 sign, but also understanding there's going to be a second fulfillment on a much deeper level with actual burning rocks falling, actual stars falling, and those events that we've seen in the Revelation 12 context studies. And then we've also learned about how the dragon stands before the woman, and the circumcision and naming time, how that's even in there too. We can even see that in the timing with the scepter departing, waiting for this time to be done. It's recorded in the Revelation 12 chapter that no name identity, hinting that that is part of it, and we also know it's part of the sign of the Son of Man. So it's incredible to see even the timing allows for all of these processes that we've learned that are even mentioned and hinted at in Revelation chapter 12. And then the different aspects of the birth thing. And then what we've learned recently with this sign completing, Jupiter getting ready to depart the scene, which is rehearsing when her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And so we have this reminder here. While we watch this Revelation 12 sign, we're reminded he was taken up into heaven. He was caught up. And... Our expectation is one day it's going to happen to us too in like manner. 
And so we have this reminder right here as we watch Jupiter, the scepter, disappear into the clouds also. Again, use this booklet to remind yourself of what we have seen, but then also the lessons and the prophecy and the biblical references that go with what we're seeing now. The more we remind ourselves, the more the reality of what we've seen and where we are right now stays alive to us. And it can invigorate us and strengthen our faith when we realize that, yes, the Lord is showing us incredible things. He's shown us things in the past. He's given us wisdom right now. And he wants us to keep this in mind because there are things he's trying to show us, even right now, that are going on in the heavens that tell us to look up and to lift up our heads. So definitely download the booklet. Print it out. Makes a good reference for yourself and for sharing with others. We have seen so much, so many celestial signs telling one single story. This has been incredible. We must never forget this. We have been shown a rare and unique sign telling a story. And the more that we study that story about the sign of the Son of Man, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the more when we do look up and when we lift up our heads, the more we know that our redemption draweth nigh. Because we know the story is about our Redeemer. We're at a very important celestial time with Jupiter, the scepter, departing the scene, getting ready to depart the scene. And we have just a few days within this window. And it should catch our attention, though, the patterns of the feasts that are at this time right now. The shadows that are rehearsed at this time. Because we're at the Feast of Ingathering. We're at the Feast of Tabernacles. And right now we're at the beginning of it. And it should catch our attention how Jupiter is roughly going to be disappearing right toward the end of it. So we have great expectation right now. But then it has also caught my attention on day 23 of the biblical calendar. Which is going to be October 13th and 14th. That's when the biblical reading starts over again. The weekly Torah portion. It's starting over at Genesis 1.1. Just by itself as an incredible reminder of the Alpha and Omega picture. Starting over the story. Because they've been in the scripture reading up until the end of it. And now they're starting over again. The yearly, weekly Torah reading. And it's in this very same passage is Genesis 3.15. Which is the promise that one day God would send the Messiah. Who is going to be the seed of the woman. So keep this in mind. The promise of the seed of the woman. We're at a time right now where... We're seeing the sign of the Son of Man. We just recently saw that, which is the fulfillment of the promise in Genesis. And we're at a time now when the scepter is getting ready to depart, which is who the Son of Man, when he departed back into heaven. And we're at a time reminded of the beautiful picture of Alpha and Omega with the Word. And we've just had Celestia rehearse, the Word made flesh. And how he was then taken into heaven. We are at an incredible time. So many things reminding us of the sign of the Son of Man, our Redeemer. We have great expectation for him. The Alpha and the Omega, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So many reminders for us to look up with great expectation at this time. During this time of ingathering, the Feast of Ingathering, this is a time of gathering. This was essentially their version of Thanksgiving, celebrated at the agricultural year's end. And the Feast of Ingathering of Tabernacles is another first fruits festival where they bring the first fruits of their summer fruit. The wave offering was the first fruits of the barley harvest, and Pentecost was the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and now Tabernacles is the first fruits of what has grown after Pentecost. So they're giving thanks to God for all that He has blessed them with, the bountiful harvest. And this is also when they build the booths and they remember how God delivered them out of Egypt and how they lived in booths for a while, reminding them how they had temporary residences where they lived while they were transitioning to their final destination, to their final home. And how the Lord is the one who brought them out of Egypt to the land of Israel. Deuteronomy 16:15. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks. And in the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. These three important feasts were related to the first fruits. And the emphasis was God's going to bless you. Bring the first fruits of it to the Lord at this time. And this is a time of rejoicing for what the Lord has done in your life. But notice how he emphasizes this will take place in the place which the Lord shall choose. It wasn't just for them to pick the place. The place had significance of where they were celebrating and where they were rejoicing how God blessed them. Numbers 18.1 And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh. 
and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. When God brought them into the promised land, they set up the tabernacle at Shiloh. And this is where they're going to be gathering every year for these feasts, commemorating the first fruits and how God blessed them. And they had to make sure that they were not showing up empty handed. They had to bring the first fruits of how God blessed them and what God was doing in their life. They would bring it to Shiloh. And Shiloh was where God was tabernacling with them. God was dwelling in a tent in their midst. And he said, I want you to assemble. I want you to gather to where I am. And I want you to rejoice in bringing the first fruits. I want you to come and assemble, gather together at these three feasts. I want you to gather together where I am tabernacled in Shiloh, which also bears his name. And that reminds us of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John was recounting the Son of Man, how he was born. He was the promised seed of the woman. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt there has the idea of tabernacling, like a tent to camp. God camped, tabernacled with us when he was made flesh. He was born, he grew up, he had his time of ministry, and then he was caught up to heaven. The disciples knew that God dwelt with them. They observed him during his time of ministry. They observed how the word was made flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. He lived down here with us. Just like the picture of the tabernacle, how God dwelt in their midst. And like picture, Jesus was God tabernacling at the time of the disciples amongst them in their midst, dwelling and tabernacling with them. Which also reminds us, though, of the future promise that one day he wants us to tabernacle with him. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to repair a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is a beautiful promise that our Redeemer, our Bridegroom, our Beloved has left us. While he was down here tabernacling amongst us, dwelling amongst us, he gave the promise that one day he was going to go away, repair a place where we would go, so we could tabernacle and dwell with him, where he lives now in the heavens. He has gone to repair a place where we will tabernacle with him. And we find this beautiful promise even in the book of Revelation, how Christ wants this fellowship, and this is what he calls to even now, how on a spiritual level we should be desiring to be as close to God, tabernacling with him in fellowship now, staying close to his side, staying close to where we can hear his voice. And he even offers the reward of being as a pillar in the temple of my God. The picture of the ultimate closeness and fellowship, tabernacling with God. This is a future promise that we can be reminded of right now here at this time of tabernacles. Reminded that we're in a temporary dwelling right now. We're strangers and pilgrims here. This is not our home. We have a home in eternity. And this is a good reminder for us right now not to get caught up with the booth where we're living at now, the circumstances that we're living at now, not get caught up with the cares of this life. Keep our heart and affection set on things above for things that are eternal because we're just in a temporary dwelling right here. We are strangers and pilgrims promised a home up above. We find one particular story of Jesus at Tabernacles in John 7, 8, where he told his brethren, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Now we have to be careful about reading into stories that are not prescriptive, that are just descriptive. 
But we find ourselves at this time of this feast, this time of the Feast of Tabernacles, when you read it more in context. And for this particular one, Jesus did go up to it. He went even at the beginning. And just take note that it was at the midst that he went up to the temple. He was at Jerusalem there observing the feast for the days before that, but it was at the midst of the feast that he went up into the temple and taught. And so Jesus was at the Feast of Tabernacles the entire time, but he just went up to the temple in the midst of it, which was the house of God. It was the picture of where God was tabernacling in the midst of his people. So powerful pictures tying with Jesus and tabernacles, but we can't read too much into it because nothing here is mentioned prescriptive. And it reminded me of the beautiful picture in Nehemiah 8 where they were reading God's word and they learned about the Feast of Tabernacles which they had not been observing, and so they decided to go out and observe it. So they went forth into the surrounding mountains, and they got different branches, and they built the booths as it was written, verse 15. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. A beautiful picture here of people who desired to do what God wanted, and desired to have a fellowship and relationship with God. And when they realized that there were things that they needed to do, they did it. And it's just a beautiful picture how they set up booths even in the courts of the house of God. In the temple courts, they were setting up their booths. Again, a beautiful picture and reminder of what's written in Revelation about how God wants us to be as a pillar in the temple of our God. He wants us to have an ultimate closeness. This is what he desires, not just in eternity, but here right now. And we can use this feast shadow at this time to remind us to draw close to the courts of God in our life and in our heart right now. But we're also reminded of it for eternity, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Beautiful reminders here. We are in an earthly, fleshly tabernacle right now. We are strangers and pilgrims here, where we dwell. But we know this is not our permanent home. This is just a temporary home. It's going to be dissolved. We can feel it getting older every single day, and we groan living in this tabernacle. But our hope and expectation is a tabernacle, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, the promise of the home that has been prepared for us. And we're at a time where we are reminded of our bridegroom, who was the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us, that he gave the promise, and he gave the earnest as a promise, that one day he would return to take us to where he is. There are multiple layers and shadows to this Feast of Tabernacles time. And we also know prophetically it's going to be fulfilled in the future. So that does leave some remainder that we should expect of the Feast of Tabernacles here, because we also know it's going to be fulfilled in the future. Zechariah 14:16, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. During the millennial time period after the tribulation, when all the armies do come against Jerusalem, when he defeats them, when he comes down and sets up his earthly kingdom, those that do remain, the survivors, they will form the different nations and groups, but they will come up every single year to the Feast of Tabernacles. That will still be observed in the future time. And so we just keep that in mind with what we see right now with the shadow of Feast of Tabernacles. We don't know and we can't state whether Christ will come at the beginning, the middle, or the end. We just know this picture does apply to us, how Christ dwelt with us and one day we will dwell with him. But we also got to keep in mind a portion knowing that it's going to be fulfilled in the future during the millennial reign as well. We're at a time where we are watching. We are watching with great expectation. We are looking for Alpha and the Omega, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Son of Man, our Redeemer. The one who purchased us, the one who made our atonement. We're awaiting the redemption, the pickup of the purchased possession. We're reminded of all these things at this time. We're reminded how the Word was made flesh in multiple ways, the history, the shadows, and the celestial signs. And we're also reminded of the promise that one day, He who dwelt among us will gather us to dwell with Him. We have this promise, we have this reminder at this time. 
We've had so many reminders that our bridegroom, our redeemer, our beloved cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Let's use this time to draw close to our redeemer, having an ear to hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Let us rehearse what we have been shown, and let us serve our Lord, our redeemer, Jesus Christ, first and highest above all else. Maranatha. <laughs>